progress. I hope you don't mind. I have learned by doing enough of these that whenever you're hanging out with interesting people, you always catch some gold, and we might as well catch the gold. Yeah, always. What's up, dude? How are you? I was reading through your bio stuff on this. This is pretty cool stuff, man. Yeah, thanks, man. Where, where are you located at? I like your we, setup over there. Thank you. I just put the, the bat cave together, man. This thing is pretty cool. So I put this whole recording studio together, actually. Um, yeah, I got like everything in here is soundproof. The ceiling, everything went nice. pretty hard. Went pretty hardcore on it. I need to do something like that. I I normally I work in my office, um, but my wife and I are planning to move next year. So like I don't want to renew my office space. So it goes my lease goes till August 31st. I used to have like 20 of my employees. We were all there, but everybody's remote now. We've just been remote since the pandemic. So I've just been main. I like the office space and I like going to it. But anyway, long story short. So now come the end of the summer, I'm going to be working from home all the time. I have a three and a half year old and a seven year old, almost eight year old. And often they don't get along well. So <laughs> I'm doing podcasting. This will be interesting, but uh, whatever. Like when I'm, I've gotten to the point where when I record, I don't care what's in it anymore. Like it's life, you know, like Yesterday, I was interviewing somebody on my podcast, and I just decided to have a coughing spasm in the middle of it. And at the end of it, I'm like, <laughs> I'm not Keep editing it. any of that out. That's real life. And I'm I'm not dead. I'm still here. So <laughs> that's funny. My dogs go nuts all the time. So like, I'm right there with you. I'm like, yeah, yeah. well, that's happening. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's, that's awesome, dude. Yeah, I saw you had a couple podcast things going on. Like, uh, you go through the mental health aspect of it, but I was reading too. Let me pull this on the screen where I'm not looking sideways. <clears throat> I really like that thing, the change. Like, I'm like, I got to check this out because that sounds really cool. And uh, you're now you're on Beyond the Microphone, right? Right. So the change is kind of how I got into podcasting. And I did a season with that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so like my main gig I've been doing for the last almost seven years is the CEO of this IT consulting agency with about 25 employees. And I, you know, I could give you the whole spiel now. Just tell me to stop because, like, you know, I could, it's a whole story. And there's you're a lot super, of you're super successful. You're a really big deal. People know you. Yeah, yeah we get this, <laughs> we get the story. You're the man. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, really, um, so I'll give you the high, high levels. Like in okay. 2019, like, kind of like right around the time when my three and a half year old was born and he's my fourth kid. Okay. So like, and I just turned 50. So I've been, I don't know, man, I've been pumping out kids for a while, it seems, but <laughs> keep doing what you're I, good at, man. I was so running my company just, this is before the pandemic. Um, I started getting anxiety attacks. I had never, I had only had one in my entire life and there was a reason for that one, but I really never had one. And, um, I started getting them like he was maybe like two months old. He had a medical condition come up that was pretty stressful for me and my wife. I was working about 80 hours a week. I'm sleeping about three hours a night because I I was working with this Indian team on this project. And so I had to be up like mm -hmm. during the middle of their day. So I'd work all day and then I'd finish and I'd do the whole family thing, get the kids to bed and then be back online. And because I was already up, I told my wife, like, look, I'm already up. When he gets up, if I'm still awake, I'll put him back down to stay asleep. So I was sleeping about three hours a night. All that started culminating in me just getting these progressively worse and worse anxiety attacks. Um, and it was like my mental health was the, the like rock bottom. I had never felt as bad and couldn't see I couldn't see how I was going to get out of it. I, Mm -hmm. I was really struggling and it was a really dark time. And I kind of realized, you know, a couple months later after dealing with it, like I have to do something about this. Like I can't just expect that it's going to go away much like it just kind of appeared out of nowhere. Right. So I ended up hiring some really expensive savvy developers so I can get myself out of these projects I was on. Cause like as a CEO, I mean, I shouldn't, I was doing too much. Right. Um, so really long story short, I ended up hiring this executive consultant or executive coach. 
she was also kind of like a trained therapist and we really uncovered a lot. I mean, I had like dealt with a lot of childhood trauma um, and a particular event that like not something I blacked out, but for some reason I never made the connection. Like when I was six years old, my parents had gotten divorced and my mom would have this teenage babysitter kid come over and watch me and my brothers right when my mom would leave he would lock us in my mom's closet barricade the door and turn he the lights were controlled from the outside he'd shut off the lights it's pitch black dark in there and then he'd invite all of his buddies over and they'd party so we were in there for hours and i i mean i was just talking to my coach i'm like remembering that terror feeling and i'm like holy shit now i'm having like claustrophobic anxiety attacks like 40 years later like go figure right and there was there's a lot more to it that story that's dark and not good um beyond that which i'd be happy to discuss on the podcast but i think the part of the story that's most interesting is really how i took that as an opportunity to really like understand mindfulness and you know adopt some of these tools that Kristen was teaching me about to like really not just you know deal with my anxiety attacks but like fix some stuff that was like in there that you know was had resulted in a lot of like bad stuff in my life like i got i'm on my second marriage that's going well but i was divorced right so I have two old, my older two are like 23 and 21. So, <clears throat> but anyway, some drug use there, just alcoholism. And so like, I had a revelation, like it all boils down to the fact that I had had a revelation after I started working with Kristen, that a lot of like the negative self-talk and trauma was really related to this one event that happened. And, and ultimately what came out of that was me recognizing that I was a victim of something and not a perpetrator, which had been a belief system I created. So here I am now with this revelation, you know, kind of understanding that I had to get in control of fixing the things that were broken in my life, in myself. I had a platform as a CEO of a company and, you know, something that I always kind of identified with myself is I, I feel like I've always had like a very heightened sense of empathy. And so I really started to tune into these like messages you hear from people like Gary V, you know, like about leaders that are running their companies with an empathetic approach, team first, you know, focused on trying to create a good like work-life balance for their team and so that's where I kind of was like, well, that's the platform that I want to have. Like I am a CEO, I have this platform. I'd like to speak authentically and share my story in a podcast that I'm going to create and call The Change because also what was happening at this time is the pandemic, the great resignation, people, you know, all of us were suffering, suffering a traumatic experience globally. And, and so that's where the change kind of came from, you know, focusing on servant leadership, conversations around leading with empathy, emotional intelligence, work-life balance and burnout, career change, um, this kind of old school business management methodology that I came up in in my career versus like, you know, some changes that the millennial and Gen Zers were driving. So it was like exploring all that. And I loved that podcast. I had really, I, I met some great people and, you know, produced a lot of great content. Now, then I talked to my coach, Kristen, and by this time now we had become actually really good friends. Like we kind of went from executive coach therapist to really good friends because there was a lot that we had in common and um, just a lot of like, kind of soul level connections, you know? So I talked her into hosting a podcast because she had expressed an interest. And so then she started a podcast called How I Made It Through. And me being an entrepreneur, I was like, well, I'm going to create a production company and I'll produce your podcast. So I've been producing her podcast. She's about to go into season three. Um, as I started to get really busy with her podcast, um, 
so you know the majority of what i've done in my career is in the it space is in software development like myself being a software developer so we got busy enough and we had a big enough team we had like marketing people and sound engineer and different hosts and my assistant so i'm like well i'm just going to build a software platform so that we can all collaborate and we all know what to do like on a day-to-day -day basis of what people need to be doing what marketing material we need to be turning around and publishing and stuff like that so i wrote this thing initially because I just had a vision that we were going to use it internally. Out of that grew a whole platform now, which is called PodTask. I don't know if you saw that when you were looking up. Go check out www.podtask.com. So it's basically a workflow management application for podcasters or podcast producers to manage everything they got going on to automate as much as they can. It'll send out questionnaires email notifications, you can, you can check it, definitely check it out. But so then I started to get really busy with that. And ultimately that's when I decided to put the change on hiatus so I can focus on this platform. And that really is my main future direction is, is in pod task. And so now I have a newer podcast called Beyond the Microphone where I interview podcasters about, you know, not just technically like what they are doing to like, grow their podcast because I feel there's a lot of podcasts that you know where it's like what are you doing for marketing tips and tricks and stuff like that it's more like like for me I would love to interview you like how did you get into podcasting what's your story what's where does your passion and purpose in podcasting come from what have you discovered along the way about not just in podcasting but about yourself right so um I am using that podcast as a way to kind of like call to action and monetize pod task and so, but it, but it's fun. I really, I think more than anything, I'm having more fun with beyond the microphone than I did with the change because I'm like connecting with people like you, like where I do the same thing as you. And we have that connection where we get each other, you know? So anyway, that's, that's me, man. Tell me about you. That's pretty awesome. man. thank you for sharing. I appreciate that. There's a lot in there too. I can see, uh, you had to go through that stress, fear, pressure, identity cocktail there for your anxiety. That's pretty exciting. So yeah, there's I, even more big picture stuff, but I, I I'm, I'm assuming this 15 for... year old was was a monster in your life. I'm assuming this kid was a core piece with him and his asshole friends doing some pretty shitty things to you guys. Oh, uh, which kid? The 15 year old. I'm sure. Oh, he oh was... the, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, the the, t the babysitter you're talking about. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. I mean, I'm I mean, sure. I'll... Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you straight out, do. like, so, like, they would lock us in a closet, and they would, you know, and then he'd invite his friends over, and eventually, like, we'd get out, we'd get let out of the closet, mm -hmm. and um, they thought it would be funny to molest me and my brothers, mm -hmm. you know, like, my older brother had it, you know, what they did to him was worse, and he still really has a hard time talking about it, but, uh, but still, like, I hid it forever, I never talked to anybody not my parents, not my brothers. I never told my ex-wife about it. I never mm -hmm. told my current wife about it. And so ultimately like the revelation I had was that I had built a belief system of shame, thinking that I had caused to happen what happened. I was six years old. I, it wasn't even, no six year old has that in their consciousness yeah. unless it's imposed on them, right? Cause I never, so anyway, um, yeah, like the, the way you had to suppress that was really tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't block it out. I honestly, weirdly, I never thought it had relevance in my life mm -hmm. until what really happened was in my second session with Kristen, we were having a conversation about guilt and shame. And I brought it up because I was talking about my divorce with my ex wife and how I had felt guilt because my kids who are now older, like, I could tell that it impacted them, you know, especially my, my son, who's now 21, like, mm -hmm. and, she, and Kristen is like, well, you know, do you feel, what is it you feel like guilt or do you feel shame Adam? And I'm like, I like, what's the difference? I didn't really know. And so she explained it to me and I'm like, okay. What, what was her definition? If I, so I'm paraphrasing, but it was something along the lines of like shame 
is something that identity and belief systems are built out of versus guilt. It's like a shit feeling, but it's like, it doesn't like define who you are. Like those mem those guilty feelings don't define who you are like shame can do. Yeah. And so we just that was my second session with her. And so we just, you know, wrapped up our session. It was a Friday. Went about the rest of my day, went home, did the whole thing with the family, put the kids, my wife went to sleep and I, I finished at around midnight, like finished watching a television show and I, I turned it off and it was like, so it's like really quiet in my house. And I kind of thought back to that conversation earlier in the day with Kristen and I'm like, like, huh, like shame and guilt. Like, is there something I, I feel shameful for in my life? And it was like, once I voiced that thought, it was like the parting of the sea. It was like my higher self is like, he's ready now to process what happened. Ba, 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 ba. And I was right. like, I was like, oh my, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Everything in my life lined up in that moment. Like everything could be explained. And I was like, oh shit. Like, there it is. There it is. And so it's been a really interesting journey since then. Like, I mean, it wasn't like overnight I was all of a sudden healed. It still took time and it's still a work in progress to undo what was there for so many years. Um, but I think now, especially because I just turned 50 a couple months ago, I'm like, my like love for myself has never been higher which is translating to better relationships with my wife and my kids. And, you know, they still drive me the little ones, you know, bonkers, but they're awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, a big other thing that's happening is about four years ago, this guy that I fired at my company, he was only with me for four months. He filed a lawsuit about three years ago for wrongful termination. And, uh, it's just been an absolute bullshit scenario. I'm completely in the right, but it's just, I've spent over a hundred thousand dollars to my lawyer to defend this and massive amounts of time. And in fact, today I'll tell you like his, we were supposed to start the trial on May 10th or something it was. And a week before the trial was supposed to start, his law firm fired him. Today was the was the actual ex parte hearing in front of the judge where the judge, I still don't know the outcome, but my lawyer said pretty much the judge is going to let them off. But it's been, you know, that's been also driving the anxiety and just shitstorm of stress and anxiety and yeah. just negativity in my life. And about three months ago, I was like, you know what? Instead, I'm going to choose a path of curiosity about this event that has been put in front of me and, and kind of center stage in my life for the past couple of years. And I'm going to try to like look to what it's trying to teach me and a number of things. So number one, I'm actually in the process of selling my company because I don't like that work anymore. I'm, I'm trying to do the podcasting stuff, right? You did that job. It is done. Yeah, I've been in that world for 17 years and now this whole podcasting universe has opened up for me and there's so and that's where I really like that fills my cup. Mm -hmm. the connections, the conversation, just trying to help educate podcasters and support them. So I'm trying to sell my company. I've been wanting to move from San Diego up to the San Francisco area where I'm from for the last 12 years. And so now that's happening. Um, we're going to do one more school year for my kids here. And and then uh, so next summer we'll move. So anyway, I mean, that's, I don't know if I would have gotten to that place where I can be okay with, you know, that type of big thing happening in my life and be more curious than anything about it. Uh -huh. uh, and then, you know, try to learn the lessons of the universe and and follow what the lessons are teaching me. So Anyway, I've been rattling on forever, so. It's good. No, 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 you're good. It's actually impressive. You found some of the pieces that you need for it. Um, I actually have the cure to anxiety. Like this, step by step. This is exactly what you need to do. And it's been working internationally across the globe. 
people okay. who are on medication no longer are on medication. Like, I don't need it. We got rid of the actual piece. And I know exactly what to do. Even on a live call two days ago, I had a girl have a panic a panic attack. And I said, go through the training. And in real time, within 60 seconds, she was back in control. Good. What do you do for like, that? So I'll, I'll go through that part. Um, yeah, just some cool things. Also, I want to do this, uh, the shame and guilt thing. That's a really tricky one to try to break down. Good thing for you uh, to figure that out. Um, the simple, one of my one of my gifts is to take extremely complicated things, philosophy, psychology, um, the, the things that we do in life, and I make it really, really focused and simple. How do I use it in a simple way? Uh, the difference from guilt and shame, guilt is feeling bad for what you did. Shame is feeling bad for who you are. Yeah, there you go. Good. That's, so that's a great explanation. Way easier to go. Let me process. Oh, I did something and it made my kids feel like this. That's why I feel guilty. I am bad and that's why I feel like this. Well, that's who you are. And it's easier to break down like which piece is happening right now because every loss is a lesson. So I did something that taught me something shitty. Don't do that again. So then I don't have to hold on to guilt. Guilt, shame, judgment, these things just blame. They just get in the way of healing. Yeah. And so one of the second rules in the, the warrior's way is no blame, shame, judgment, and guilt. That happened. That's it. It happened. I don't have to call you names or judge you or put you down or tell you you're a bad person or you're going to hell. No, it's in the way. It's just in the way of healing. It doesn't matter. I can't change time. I can't go back. It doesn't work like that. But yeah. I can learn a lesson and then let go of the stuff I don't need. And, and that and way, by, by learning the lesson too, I I've felt empowered. Like correct. it empowered me, you know. Absolutely right. And so that's just one piece. That's just sh the guilt and shame. Uh, it's tricky too because almost everything wires back to belief systems. I'll show you my map at some point. And this is where I show like the breakdown for how we operate to break through your grieving cycles, especially the. I've gone through so much stuff with rape, molestation for people who have been uh, abused, abandoned, you name, addiction you, across the board. We've killed all of them. In fact, there's yeah. actually only one curse I haven't beaten yet. And like, I'll tell you that in a little bit. But uh, it's kind of it's kind of crazy when you're going through your loss system. If you're still working through the pieces, um, something was taken with this kid, him and his friends. Something was taken, and, and you're trying to go through the pieces of what was gone. It could be. Uh, power was taken. It could be innocence, could be dignity. There's something there that like something from me was taken. And a lot of the neuro-linguistic stuff that we would do, uh, which is high level stuff we would go into, is like going into the memories and really taking your fucking power back. Well, you don't go in as a six-year-old. You go in as me and you now. And I bet you that kid would have a very different point of view if we were standing there. Sure. You know, and so then it makes new memories. Now you take power back. You take your things back. You protect your brother. Right. Like you create a new memory that makes it so you no longer have to carry shame. You know, yeah. you don't have to anymore. You don't have to feel bad for who you are because somebody else is bad for who they are. Right. You know, and that's obviously a high level training. Like we go in and that's, that's a big deal. Those are hard ones. Um, but otherwise, like I'll break down um, anxiety for you because I think you have the pieces, but there's a couple pieces that'll help you um, catch it beforehand. And this will give you a lot more power. So I'll give, give you a couple. Actually, I'm on Anxious and Ambitious, their podcast next week again. So I'm doing theirs again. I'm going to share my screen with you because we can go through a little journey together. This is just, yeah. this is just, hey, this is just stuff. I got uh, 700 of these. You want fear? You want doubt? You want depression? You, I'll show you how to beat them all. They're all beatable. I'll show you the simplest way to take 50 different books and make it a sentence. I'll show you. Yeah. This is probably why people like what I do. All right. Let's go in. Anxiety is simply just uh, fear multiplied. You know, the Lao Tzu point of view, like people who are um, stuck in the past have depression. People who are in the future have anxiety. People who have presence in the present have peace. That's just ancient Chinese proverbs. Anxiety is fear multiplied. This means fear itself. Fear is not real. It's possible futures that may or may not ever happen, and most of the times never happen ever. 
And so whenever you're in your, this could go wrong and this could go wrong. And what if this happens and this guy could say this, and what if they do this? And what if I lose that? And what if they do this for me? And then I'll lose my whole company. And then I won't be able to take my kids. And what if this happens? And what if I get sick? And what if they do like, right. we're going into all of the things that could go wrong. Now throw in your cocktail of three hours of sleep. I've got to be a good dad, take care of a baby working 80 hours a week. And then uh, my kid has a medical condition. Uh, good luck keeping your sanity. Because all of the things that could go wrong now go from like possible to inevitable. And you can't yeah. discern the difference because it's like, how could it not go wrong? And so you're stuck in this like, oh, I'm about to explode most of the time. What fear is, is just, it's just anxiety, it's just fear multiplied. Take something that could go wrong. Now open 50 to 100 tabs of possible futures. And then start living with the emotions for each one, but too many variables to actually complete it because it's the future. So I don't know who's going to really be there, who's going to say what, what's really going to happen if there's a variable of something. But I still have an emotion attached to all of these unsolved open tabs, which creates a paralysis by possibility. There's too many things that could go wrong, and I don't want to do anything. <laughs> Because I can't, I don't know what thing to deal with. And so yeah. a lot of the the actual thing comes down to a test that I do for people to see if you have uh, a clinical medical issue or is this something that has, like uh, Dr. Dispenza says, you thought yourself sick. You know, mm -hmm. let's see which one it is. And so I would take people and I would challenge them to go, think of a time before when you were like anxious, like something was going to happen. Like it could be giving a public speech in front of everybody, or, you know, I have to, you know, learn to drive a car or get a brand new skill. And I don't know what I'm doing yet or a new job or ask a girl out or something like, Oh God, oh, my heart's pounding on this one. I don't know what to do. What am I going to do here? Oh, you know, and you're like, Oh man, I was so anxious at that time. Think back at that time, whether it's the speech, ask a girl out, learn a new skill, new job. I don't care what it is. Do you still have anxiety about it now? Hmm. Like if you yeah. think back, do you think do you have anxiety right now? If I think about like, well, that event. Are you want me to actually think of one right now? Yeah, I would. Do you I mean think of anything where like, man, I had anxiety for that event. Like I had to do something that's like that's pretty intimidating. That's a big deal. Or my first time I've ever done one. You don't have to tell me a story, just at least think of yeah. one. Okay. All right. So what is the event? Just any of you don't have to tell me a story, just what is the event? Um, I mean, it's kind of like a repetitive thing that happens with my business. Although, you know, I feel like my mindset is equipped to handle it now, but running a professional services company, it's a freaking roller coaster ride, right? So like you know, we ride these highs where it's like money's coming in, we're crushing it, we're accumulating all this money in the bank, these projects wrap up, you end up in a trough, and it's a shit storm, and I got payroll to run, and where's the money gonna come from? And all right, it's are you are you seven years of doing are, this? Are you in the future or are you thinking of an event from the past? Well, no, this is this has happened in the past numerous times. And the anxiety is is always thinking of the future, like how are we gonna get past this so that it doesn't happen anymore? Let's go back five years ago to one of those ups and downs. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's think of even when you were at the lowest of the down. If you think about that moment, like back then, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year. I got gotcha. you. Five years ago. Let's look at that like when it was really, really bad. Do you have anxiety about that day? Am I feel, can I feel anxiety now for the memory of that day? Yeah. Is that kind of where you're getting at? Yes. The memory of the feeling is there, but it's not, I don't think it triggers me the same way, but I recognize the feeling. Like that's where I think like I've learned how to, you mindfulness to like recognize that feeling and get ahead of it right right but do you have to get ahead of something that happened five years ago sometimes 
Well, right um, now, right now, are you having? Yeah, I mean, right now it's not triggering. Like, it's not. That's, no. that's what I'm getting at. Is like you can think about a day when it was a tough day at the time, but what happens after that? Does it ever go back up? Like you said, some days it's highs and it goes low and then, you know, the business picks back up and then we're back on a high and then it goes low and then it picks back up. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that that definitely was more prevalent that that being a recurring pattern in the past. Yeah. Yeah. So now, you know, but, you know, after that glow, it's going to pick back up like, you know what happens. So like I know that at that time it was going to go low, but at the time I didn't know it was going to pick back up. So I was worried at that time. But now I know that it picks back up, so I'm not as worried about that time. That's part of it. I mean, because, yeah, definitely, like, just having experience. Like, now, you know, I like one of my business partners, like, he still freaks out, like, mm-hmm. when, you know, the team doesn't have much work and we're seeing money kind of drain from the bank. And I'm like, you know what, man? It's like, we've been through this storm numerous times. We've always worked ourselves out of it you know? correct well this is the next part to it so just by doing that if you were to have had an anxiety attack thinking about five years ago you may have a clinical issue right well you're like well no i know what happens and we worked through that and you know i'm far more experienced now and so i don't have that issue with that oh partly i think you know in and this is a Exactly mirroring what you're saying, but so like after I so Kristen could only take me so far because mm-hmm. she wasn't like she was an executive coach, although she had also been a trained therapist. You know, when I when I came back after my revelation, when I had the following session with her, she's like, you know, I I definitely would advise you to continue working with me, but also, you know, find a trauma therapist. Um, so I did, and she would walk me through these sessions where we really tried to take myself back to that moment of being six years old and being in that closet terrified and and get that like feeling back so that I can you know recognize it to be able to then like package it up in a little box and send it down the river floating away from me right was that helpful for you extremely because we did that every time I met with her we did that and by the time we got to like our fourth session, it, it, the memory of it, because at first, like it did, it was triggering with me. And like, for example, like when I would meet with her, it was in her tiny little windowless office. Mm-hmm. And just being in that office was triggering to me with the claustrophobia. Yeah. But by the time we got to the fourth or fifth session and we would go through those exercises, I wasn't feeling that anymore. And I couldn't, and in fact, I couldn't even bring back as much as I tried to bring back that feeling, I couldn't, I was having a harder and harder time, like having it re-manifest in me. That's awesome. That's very, that's cool. Like there's different ways to do that. I usually, uh, I go the other route with it because um, if you go back as a six-year-old, it's tough to take power back that's taken. And so whenever I do a lot of that, the same type of exercises I go in, it's like, let's go you and me. Like right now. Yeah. Like. You're, no, you're she pushing. and she kind of took that same angle because, like, Good. I think it was like the second or third time. She's like, "Now I want you to picture yourself, who you are right now in your current form, yeah, in there in the closet with that six-year-old version of you, mm-hmm. and now you're holding his hand and you're you're telling him it's it's going to be okay, you know." That's that's more like that's where you create the memories of like, "Hey, you were okay there because you were there," you know, right. and you can actually comfort that kid. Like, it's it's that's pretty effective. That's good. Let's get to the next piece. Let's get to the next part because the let go part is good. Let's get into like now we got to handle the future. We got to handle the next piece. I think we just agreed you don't have a chemical issue where you can't handle it because there's a neurological break. No, you just had a lot going on and you didn't have tools. That's not crazy. That's everybody. So let's go into some of the tools. So first, I got to see if you have um, any of the tools to be able to manage the reality of things. So first off, when we get into all of the things that could go wrong, all the things that could go wrong, as soon as you know which one it is, does it still give you massive anxiety when you go, that's the one that's the real future? That one thing, does it usually like freak you out when you go like, oh, it's actually going to be this thing that happens? Or are you like, no, I'm prepared enough now that I know how to handle when I do know what it is? 
I, I mean, I'm not in complete control yet. And I don't, and I would question if we ever can get in complete control of our thoughts and reactions, but um, I would say certainly. Careful on, careful on that belief. I don't know if we can ever have complete control is wrong because I have too many people who have done it with like massive medication and full blown panic attacks who are like, I don't have those anymore. So I don't have them anymore, but mm -hmm. I guess I wanted to just, because I'm definitely not a believer in absolutes. Um, well, for sure. Cause like we're human and like, you know, I think you, our well, journey is always meant to be, you know, we're always exposed to things that we're meant to learn from, sure. but that's the path I'm on. Like I'm on the path at least where, um, number one, the foundation, the foundational stuff is the best it's ever been. And I'm mm -hmm. very confident in that. Good. And I know I can handle a lot. Um, I guess where I leave wiggle room is, I mean, my house might burn down. I don't like. That's danger. This is that. danger. Right, right now. If you're worried about the house burning down, I'm not worried about it. I just, you know, again, it's just. Which is, which if the house starts to burn down, I'm pretty confident you would be able to start handling. Oh, well, the house is on fire. Let's get the kids and get the hell out of here. That's a dangerous scenario that even if it did happen, you would handle it. And then you would get your homeowner's insurance involved and get all new shit. I've had two house fires. You just get a whole bunch of new stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Like better it's stuff. Not, you get the not, better definitely version. Definitely not something I'm worried about, but uh, again, just myself being a non believer in absolutes, I guess that's. Uh, sure. Anyway. sure. And, and this but is I where let's get. Perspective on it. My, my point of view on this is there's two kinds of people. You're either trained or not trained. You either know how to do something or you don't. You know, okay. and so in which case, this is the warrior aspect, you know, and this is where, like, do you know what you're doing or not? Do you have the tools or do you have the expertise or you don't? And that's it. Like, it's not good or bad either way. It's just do you or don't you? In which case, let's go through some tools. All right. Let's look at your inventory. All right. Do you have problem solving skills? Yes. Okay. We have the, we got one. All right. Do you have creativity? Have you ever had to get outside the box to figure something out? Every day. Right on. So we've got we got some good ones here. Do you have a support system or people you can lean on for advice or questions? I'm stuck. You guys see yes. a different way. You got a support system. Uh, do you have resourcefulness where if I don't have it yet, I can figure out how to get it? Oh, yeah. All right, good. Um, do you have uh, more experience on handling high-pressure situations now than you did when you were way less experienced? Oh, yeah. All right. Now we have to do a, a collaboration of these things and see what the results are. What is the percentage survival rate you have for all the stuff you've gone through? Like, what's well, your survival rate so far? Hundred percent. I'm I'm here. Hell yeah, you are. You got a one. Up. There is nothing yet that has taken you out. You are survived yeah. everything, and right now you have better problem solving, better creativity, better resourcefulness, a better support system, and far more experience and aptitude to handle whatever comes up. This totally. gives us a degree of certainty to go like, I'm actually going to go more into the positive aspect of the reason you have anxiety is not because you're messed up. It's because you are brilliant. You have a creativity and imagination system that is so powerful. You're creating futures that you can go into and have feelings from a reality you imagined. Have you ever had an argument with your wife in your head? <laughs> yes. Who made up her answers? Dummy up here. That's you. Who were you fighting with then? You were you were fighting you. How did that make you feel when you're in the car going, you fucking bitch? And like, she's not even, you're fighting you. Yeah, that's it's completely irrational, but it's, good point. It is brilliant you created an alternate reality where you actually had emotions around something that wasn't happening that is an amazing superpower what an amazing ability you have but left untrained and you don't know how to use it it controls you and takes over for you but if you control that power it goes from uh, anxiety into clairvoyance and this is where you go from fear 
to curiosity. And this is why when you said and, I went to curiosity. And that's exactly, like that's 100% spot on the lesson I learned in, in, in my own journey, right? And yep. like I said before, like I, to the, like right now, I feel more empowered. And it's a weird thing to say, but like to some extent, I'm obviously thankful for all the experiences that have happened to me in life because Correct. it made me who I am right now, you know? Absolutely. And this is where I say, let's look at the step by steps to be able to, you know, get under control that the reason you have anxiety is not because you're broken. It's because you're brilliant. You have an ability. You just aren't trained in this ability because if you look into all of these futures and instead of having like, this could go wrong, this could go wrong, this could go wrong. You go, what do I, what do I learn here? What do I learn here? What could I do if this happened? All right. That's as far as I can go. Close it. What do I learn here? That's what I would probably say, but you know, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. All right. What would I do here? That's this would go really fucking crazy. This is possible too. So we'll hold that off. What can I learn here? And you're looking into the future now and living multiple lifetimes, getting experiences and understanding without actually having to go there. Now you're just a future. You're just looking into the future and you're learning and growing at an exponential rate. This is clairvoyance. How do you control the ability? It's practice and understanding. You're not messed up. You have an amazing creativity and imagination. We're one of the only creatures that can give ourselves panic attacks when nothing's there. I can have the same feeling as a lion chasing me when there is no lion. Yeah, no, totally. That's it's amazing. Uh, the whole fight or flight system just well, that's, I think it's in our, our, our cell structure. And this goes into like the coping mechanisms and things that we have with the survival part where you can just have like, you know, taxes and still have the same feeling as a lion chasing you. Yeah, it's the, yeah. I, and I completely like look at the anxiety attacks I have now. It's the most irrational thing ever. It's like when I, like I would get them often when I would lay down to go to sleep. If mm -hmm. I didn't fall asleep right away, all of a sudden I can feel that feeling creep in and then it was there. And it's a feeling of terror as if a lion is right there about to clamp down on my neck. Correct. Because I was really like the fear was that I wasn't going to like the irrational fear was, Oh, if I don't fall asleep in two seconds, I'm going to be awake all night long and I'm going to have to repeat a whole new day tomorrow with mm -hmm. the kids and the work and everything. Yeah. It's, Completely you right. You created an imaginary scenario with parameters that would make it impossible for you to be successful. So you're absolutely a failure. Yeah. It's... I need to be asleep in two seconds or else I'm, I, this is the end. And you're like, why the two seconds thing? Why did we create that? What is that for? You know, yeah. I just made up a rule to make me now not good enough. Exactly. It's like makes, made it up. It's the stupidest it's a completely irrational. Like, it, you know, not to discount, obviously, people that go through that. It's the worst feeling in the world. But when you come to the other side, you're like, the hell was that all about? Correct. Well, it's just untrained that you have an amazing ability that's running wild. You're not you don't have an, any practice here. No different than any superhero movie where they realize they have super strength and they're ripping the door handles off and breaking the sink faucet. Like, damn it. Like, yeah. Like, you just haven't figured out how to manage this yet. You know, like Cyclops blowing a hole through the ceiling instead of being able to shoot the wings off a fly. Like, it's just not practiced yet. But it's, you know, it's dangerous if you don't control it. But if you control it, you're looking into the future now and you are the most prepared out of everybody you know. Like, it's just an ability that it's amazing that you have it. You're not messed up. But right today's society, you're called a symptom. You're given medication to deal with issues, not deal with the root. You're not right. taught that you're brilliant. You're taught you're messed up. And the identity and belief system becomes routed in. I have to behave this way because that's who I am. And that's where people start getting their belief system corrupted because they never deal with their loss and they don't ever train their abilities. They believe I am screwed up. That's who I am. I need medication. And if anything goes wrong, I shall panic accordingly because that's who I am. I have seen so many people misdiagnosed with everything from bipolar disorder, uh, ADHD, uh, PTSD, people who were misdiagnosed, but they act like the symptoms. This whole bullshit when it comes down to uh, anxious attachment disorders and shit, I'm like, these are just labels that make people start acting accordingly. Totally but they're not just real. Labels. Because they're not some, real. 
Yeah, because some individual or group of indi individuals decided that this is the this is what's normal, and if you don't fit in this paradigm, then you got some sort of a problem that needs it's, to be medicated. It's creating identity issues and making problems that are not real. Because I've seen people go, "I have anxious attachment," and then start sabotaging relationships in ways they never did before. And I'm like, "Don't you see? You created." a belief system and are creating now a self-fulfilling prophecy to make it so you can't be wrong. But you were never that before you heard this. Interesting. Yeah. It's a lot of truth in there. People misdiagnose all the time and they never get to like, well, what did you actually need? I don't know. I have anxious anxiety, so I don't have to know what I need. I'm like, that's incorrect. You still need to know what you need or you can't make a request to ever grow. Yeah. You're just going to sabotage every dynamic you have. And now you have an excuse. Which is still routed well, so in some I think form. It's an epidemic of, of people that that you know here in the year 2023 that don't know what they need, and and I just, let me share a quick story in, in by my own experience with that. So a couple of months after my revelation, as I was, this was a very hard time because I was trying to now figure out how to communicate my needs, mm -hmm. right? Because it be, what happened was I, I was a people pleaser and I was putting my kids, my family, everybody else's need before my own. And so now I'm, I'm trying to like, when I need something, learn how to communicate that and not in a, in an asshole way, you know? Sure. Sure. It took a while. I mean, I think now I, I kind of have it. I'm in a lot better place, but I remember one day in particular, it was actually in Cape Cod, which is where my wife's parents live. And we were, you know, had planned this beach day, right? And I didn't want to go. Like, I, I wanted to be by myself, right? Mm -hmm. Because um, I had had the kids for many days in a row by myself because my wife was going off. I, you know, because we're out there where she's from, like she's going off to surf and hang out with her friends. And, and it got to the point where it was building up and building up and I was getting resentful about it. And then that one afternoon, I just was finally like, I'm not going to the beach with you guys. I'm going by myself to the beach and I'm bringing a journal. Blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to go have my own time. And they were fine with that. But it just like I had built it up where I, you know, it kind of just like came out in a, kind of like an explosive way. <laughs> right. so where I was going with this is I finally get to the beach and by myself, I'm listening to if you know who Jessa Reed is, she's got a podcast called Awakening OD, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. and she was talking about she was kind of putting a challenge out to her listeners like why don't you guys try to get a journal out and write down five things that fill your cup mm -hmm. and so i'm listening to her podcast and so i'm like all right i'm gonna go take the journal to the beach by myself and i'm gonna do this i get out to the beach with my journal and it's a gorgeous day and i was still a little bit kind of messed up from just you know, the blowout earlier. And so I'm trying to sit there thinking of five things that filled my cup. I couldn't think of a, of a single one. It's really and hard. I think a lot of us go through life where we don't know, like we don't know what makes us happy anymore. Right. It's and, no training. You know, eventually the five came to me, but I thought it was really interesting that the challenge itself was really difficult when it seemingly shouldn't have been. It makes perfect sense that it is. There's a few things. Um, I'll give you an example. Maybe one day we'll do this together. Whenever I have people do the, what are your values? Like, what are your main values? Even experts, like, what are your values? Whenever I challenge their values to see if they're authentic, almost, it's very, very rare. I think I've only had maybe two times that someone actually got it right. Because they want their values to be something routed in what they want and maybe even like in some sort of pain that they don't want. Again, I want authenticity because people are always fake. It's like that's a protection system. That's not a value, you know, but the values would fall under like, well, I want to have fun. I'm like, well, to do what? What's fun? You know, what makes it fun? And you start realizing that fun is actually in connection with other people. And that's what makes the event fun, you know, and you start getting into like, well, I'm, I just like it when I can make sure that I can help these people do this. And so I think it's in, you know, respect. And I'm like, well, if you're helping people, that's in service. It's not in respect. And that tell me what the hell respect even is. I want to do it, you know. And so if you want to ever have some fun with words, 
I've got a handful of words that I've had like world experts go. I need like a week on this one. Like so, like so, I've cool. I got some really fun ones for you on that one. But even values is really tricky. Needs even more complicated. Now, personal needs get easier. And so this is where we're actually building a new tool right now because I found the tools for finding your needs incomplete. Maslow's Pyramid, uh, Marshall Rosenberg's needs, Tony Robbins. Um, you've got all these different versions of Enneagrams and uh, love languages. We've got all these things where it's like it's it's pieces, but there's no tool that encompasses how do I find my needs and then make requests for agreements with my partner or with others to fulfill needs. Because one of the things that make people angry would be unmet needs. And that causes most arguments is I don't know how to express what I need maybe (laughs) to be heard or maybe for us to connect or maybe for you just to just to listen so that that way we can grow. Like there's a growth thing that we need. Like people don't know how to say these words. They just go shut the fuck up, you know, and they don't know how to express what I need. It's really difficult to do. It is really tricky to do. And so people aren't taught that there's no class for this. You know, there's nobody teaching like, hey, when did you identify your unmet needs? You know, like, I don't even know the list of these to do. And if I look at all the convoluted way, Maslow's pyramid is wrong. I would I would do a debate with this. I'm like, it's incorrect because people can do other parts without having to have one complete. It's not correct. And so there's things like this where we have to challenge everything. Um, I got let's see. I have a book with quotes somewhere here. I'll have to find it. But I have a. Uh, there's there's a the idea where like we need to be challenging these different ideas to find the answers, but then discoveries are made when we challenge the answers. And so like we find the answers, but then challenge the answer. And we need to keep digging in harder and harder on it. I think it's a really great story of self-discovery, but it makes perfect sense that you were having a hard time. One of the hardest sections that we have, especially for men, is what do you want? Yeah. The reason it's so hard is think about what we were told our whole life. When were you ever not told what to do? Parents, teachers, coaches, bosses, spouses, like the list goes on. You need to do this. You have to do this. Do it this way. You're doing it wrong. This is the way it's done. When are you not told what to do? So like, of course, it goes on when you're married. It still does. Now, now taking the other side, most of what you do is serve and provide for others. So what do you need? What? How can I help you? What do you need? Do you need a sandwich? Do you need a paid raise? Do you need this? What do you need? How can we work? Can we build this better? What do we got to do? You're always looking at how do I make it better for the people? And then when you finally get a chance to go, all right, your turn. What do you need? You go, I was always told what to do or helping other people. I don't know what the heck I need. Yeah, And that's why, I. I mean, I think obviously that's what led into like, when I sat down with that challenge, I'm like, I have no freaking clue. Mm-hmm. Almost, almost every guy has the same silence. Yeah. Every guy has been, I've been serving others and doing what I've been told my whole life. How the hell am I supposed to know what I want? My dreamer got turned off a long time ago to help other people or do what I was told. Yeah. There's still, I will admit, there's still a level of anxiety around the provider role that I have because like, and it's obviously been amplified by the fact that I, you know, I run three companies right now and my time I have, it's impossible to carve out time for myself. Like I know that I have to do it. Yes. I know that that should come first is like taking care of myself. Cause then I'll be like the best version of me to be able to take care and provide for everybody else. Cause mm-hmm. my needs are met foundationally, but like, you know, that I guess where my wife and I continue to like, you know, just have this ongoing dialogue is because, you know, she needs me, especially now that I'm kind of planning to work from home a little bit more. It's like, I have to make it clear to her, like, that doesn't mean that I'm going to have more time to be able to like, now, that, especially because now the kids are on summer vacation from school. I'm like, it doesn't mean I'm going to be around more to like, take things off your plate and I'll watch the kids for a little bit. I have the pressure of still providing and I run three companies and all of the employees at my companies also need stuff from me and they're expecting me to provide for them. Uh The one area of anxiety I still deal with is just managing all the stuff in the air that I'm juggling. And you're you're juggling four identities. That's four different guys. Right. 
You have to yeah. juggle well, being a five. husband. Like if I husband, five. dad, like business owner, a business one, business two, and business three. Well, those and are I've all still one. Australian working. cattle dog. She's a freaking man for sure. That's so funny. Well, even still, there's more than who are you just as a man, just as you. You know, just yeah. you. Yeah, you got exactly. husband, yeah, you one. got that's, father, that's you got business owner and provider. Like there's there's so many juggles now. I'm being how many people, how many hats do I have to wear? And how do I provide? And how do how are you a good husband? And how are you a good father? And how are you a good leader? And how are you a good provider? And how am I a good like you there's let's add let's add on son because I also provide for my mother. She has no income and she's elderly and one more mouth the condo that I own and there you are. So now we have all these different identities that all have different jobs because let's face it, husband, son, and father are not the same job. Right. Like these are, these are all different different hats. You can't you cannot do the same things with mom that you do with wife. That's illegal. Like this is a different job, totally different gig, very different situation. And so um this is where like who are you supposed to be? I'm going to give you a really fun challenge. This is a hard one. This is probably, this is like an intense one, but I think that you're up to it. Uh, next time that we talk, I'd like to, I definitely need to be on pod track and be on stuff with I, any support I can do with you, I'll do. But in, in this case, my question is, I, I can't wait to hear your own subjective answer for what is balance. What is balance in a subjective mm -hmm. Okay. Your personal definition for balance, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of a, a, a direction because people go balance is just the managing of extremes. I'm like, let's get fucking serious. Balance is all these identities. Each one has to have their own time and individuality, but then there's also the head, the heart, the spirit, the body. How do I balance health in all of these categories? Um, how do I balance my growth? How do I balance development with my children? What is balance in all of these categories for who I am, for spirituality, for God, for service to others, for like all these aspects of what is balance? I'm interested to hear what you got because this is a lot more complicated than people think. And I'm just going to save you the trouble of where the hell do I begin? It's wrapped up solidly in your belief section. So I just I gave you a that. bunch of clues. Oh, it's, I mean, it's, I would think, you know, I'll just high level my response to that would be, you know, we make decisions as to like where we allocate priority to things. Mm -hmm. And and really at the end of the day, it's just decisions. Like it's just us. That's the surface. Listen, everything's a choice is my first book. I'm already with you on everything is just choices. Yeah. But what system do you use to make your priority system for balance? What is it? How do you choose what priority is more important than the other? Because if we say it on the surface, it's real easy. What's more important, your job or your son? Yeah, and like the kid, obviously. Who do you spend more time with? Not the kid. See? So this is where, like, what are my priorities and how do I manage balance? How do we do it? Talk to me as though I've never heard of it before. Right. Yeah, it's pretty it's, interesting it's, shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's a, it's like weights and countermeasures. Mm -hmm. you know, every time you take from one, you're taking away from something else. Now you're starting to see that the more I understand it, the bigger it gets. That's why this one word is such a monster. Yeah. Good one. Um, let's uh let's team up i would love to support you and i'd love to you know be able to to however i can support pod track and then you know support you i like hanging out with you i think this was fun um i'll even send you this recording if you like because i think this is some pretty good stuff here and if you want to post it post it uh this is just cool stuff let's make some more if you'd like yeah i'm interested if you're interested yeah i mean I'd be curious to like keep a dialogue going i mean i'll be transparent because you know um yeah, I mean, I'm working with numerous people right now on mindset and stuff, and I put me on a panel if you want to see something crazy. Okay, yeah, I think definitely staying in, in involved in a, in a collaboration around you know because these topics are obviously you know what are near and dear to my heart to to speak about with others and you know in terms of the content that I put out. So sure. Uh, well, well, how can I serve, Adam? Um, well, 
you know, I mean, a, a conversation perhaps on my podcast might be a good way to just, you know, put the dialogue and this content out there, be useful for others. What, tell me about your podcast. Um, it's the Warrior's Way or? Is the Battlefield of the Mind. Uh, the only reason, I, I don't mean to rush. I have a, a, a guy who's jumping in like right now, Dave yeah. Welch. So I have a different conversation. I have to do another call. But like, I would like to have some more time with you. Okay. Well, we can, uh, yeah, we could just go offline and. Either yeah. that or like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of those freaks who's recording ready at 24. I could wake up in 15 minutes and be record ready. So like, I'm just one of those guys who's been doing this for so long that like, you could be like, Hey, this, the head speaker didn't show up. Who can do an hour? I'm like, what topic do you want? Give me the okay. mic. I'm one of those guys. So like, if you want to do something, I'm in, I'm ready whenever. But uh, yeah, okay. just if you want to schedule something, let's do something crazy, man. And give me some hard stuff. I'll challenge you. You challenge me. Let's have some fun with it. Yeah, I like it. All right, man, I'll follow up with you. I'll, I'll put some some thought together. I love it. And then, yeah, I'll send this to you. This is, this is a cool dialogue. I think we got some some cool chemistry and I'd love to support you. I don't know where it goes yet. And you know what? I just think it, it's one of those things. Let's let God take the wheel. I'll, I'll go. Let's see where he, he wants to take this. I'm in. All right. Sounds good, man. Me too. All right. If you want, I'll just message Randy. She'll send you my personal info. And that All way right. you can just, just message me. Just text me and we'll make it happen. Okay. You got it. Cool. Have a good weekend. You too, Adam. I'll talk to you later. Bye.